Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Teague and I want to tell you a story about fandom. That's my family. We're a displaced Dallas Stars family. We live in Oregon. So after all three of my kids outgrew this little jersey that we put in our family photos, I didn't know how to put it into the hands of another family that would love this and the stars as much as we did. So I went online to Facebook groups, trying to connect with fellow fans. I went to other marketplaces, eBay, Poshmark, Mercari, OfferUp, but fan items get lost in the sea of everything there. Hmm. But I'm not the only one that likes to hold on to our fan gear, uh, who likes to collect these things. In fact, I want you to think about your own closet. How many college hoodies and team jerseys, hats and tees have you collected over time? How long have they been there? Which ones do you really love? If you're a college student, I will put money that you have at least, at least five pieces of branded apparel from your college in your closet today. And when you add in the different teams that you love, it's probably 10, 15, or as someone told me yesterday, oh, at least 30, okay? So we have these items, but unfortunately, fast fashion fandom is killing the planet. Collectively in America this year, you and I will each be responsible for 100 pounds of clothing and textile waste, which means it will fill 832 NFL stadiums with that waste in the form of landfills and incinerators, mostly in our own country. Let's think about that. If Taylor Swift or her boyfriend played to sold out crowds every day, they couldn't fill as many stadiums with fans as we will theoretically with textiles. So that got me thinking, what if there was a better way, a way for fans to sell from fan to fan, from closet to closet, rather than closet to discard, donate, dispose, which all leads to the landfill? Fanwagon enables second fan fashion. It's sustainable, shareable fandom that represents the stories of our fandom through the things that we wear. So we built a marketplace to enable this peer-to-peer -peer transaction where your items end up in another fan's closet. Now, we have a lot of reasons why we think that we're gonna revolutionize resale. In the interest of time and attention, I just wanna talk about two that keep coming up when I'm talking to, to people here at the conference. First of all, story selling. When you know the, the story behind an item, Inherently, that increases its value, right? And you have all been sharing stories with us about your favorite teams, your favorite jerseys, the things that you wore when you were young, the things that you wish still fit, okay? So on the platform, we're leading with story selling and our content marketing, we're, we're taking these stories of the jerseys in your fandom and we're, we're putting that online. We're even using some AI to do this in the platform right now. We're experimenting with that to really bring that narrative to life because we all have stories about our fandom that represents in what we wear. Now you might be thinking, what's a marketplace doing at the Sloan Analytics Conference? We're here to talk about data and numbers and things. But yeah, let's talk about data and numbers and things. Megan Rapino, she's here somewhere, played over 400 games in her professional career. And we know so much about what she did on the field. We know so much about what she did off the field for her sport, I wanna know about those 46 different jerseys that she wore over that time. I mean, if you're keeping track, it's almost as many jerseys as hairstyles while she played, right? But we don't know as a fan which, if stripes are more desirable, more valuable than the mandarin collar versus the paint splatter. If you're holding on to one of these, is it time to buy or sell? So let's build a valuation index based on the transactions, the items of apparel, and what our fans are actually searching and selling on the platform. And let's put some of those numbers out into the public so you can value your own collection, as well as if you're a team or a league or a manufacturer tasked with making the next best-selling kit, that you know what's bound to sell. On, fan, on FanWagon today, you can search or list your products at least nine different custom attributes. So you'll find things on our marketplace that you won't find on others. Like you can search by sport, by team, by league, event, and college, 
but also about how things fit or what theme. If you're searching for a pride jersey or a retro or an, up, an upcycled, you can search and sell like that too, which is really, really cool. All the while, I'm trying to reduce so much friction in the selling process and make it so easy that even my 10-year-old can help me list and sell products. Now, the market is clearly big enough for this white space that we've identified. In fact, as I said earlier, we're spending almost $11.5 billion a year on licensed sports apparel. You're welcome, fanatics, if you're in the room. Okay. So if we can take 5% of what's in your and my closet and fans' closets across North America, and we can run that through the marketplace every year, we'll do north of $200 million in GMV, just at 5%. And if we had no other revenues other than the commission that we're going to take on those, our base revenue will be about $3.2 million. But that's not the only way that we plan to make money. Today, the commission is split between the buyer and the seller. This is a binary decision if you want a skew of one or not. So the buyer is willing to pay 7%. The seller can pay 7% in the transaction fees. And then we can increase with premium revenue or premium fees to make revenue, upgraded fees, promoted listings, front of the line access to the pieces that you really, really want. Obviously, we can license some of this data. We are going to explore some marketing partnerships with teams and events and colleges and fan groups. And down the line, I'm really interested in how we do in-market fulfillment with secondhand apparel, like we're doing on first run. I think that's really, really interesting. So to this point, I bootstrapped until about last week when my first investor check dropped, which was awesome. We're hiring our core team. We're recruiting sellers to come onto the platform to go from 100 to 1,000 pieces of inventory this month. But I know that fandom is better shared. So my ask for you today is super simple. Will you all join me on FanWagon? Thank you. All right. OK. Oh, great presentation. Thanks. Very lively. Thank you. Um, I think the biggest question I have to start out is, um, what differentiates FanWagon from the other marketplaces that you mentioned? And there certainly are plenty of them. Yeah, there certainly are, right. Um, so a couple things. One that stands out to me as a non-tech tech founder is that eBay came out, what, 27 years ago, Amazon uh, two, three decades ago. The, the platforms that we use today that we think of modern marketplaces, Poshmark 2011, Sideline Swap 2015, these are all platforms that were really cemented in Web 2. We can build today on the edge of AI, Web 2, Web 3. So we talked a lot about authentication with a lot of you who have come and asked us about that. And I know that in the future, merchandisers are going to be minting their authentic product on the blockchain. So we want to be right there in lockstep or push them to do that for authentication. These are things that we can do because we're building tech today for tomorrow's shopping experience. I believe that shopping shouldn't be less about searching and saving and more about getting a push notification that says, hey, Tiffany, we know that you're going to a game in a couple of weeks, and this jersey might not be perfect for you, but it matches like 85% of what you want, so you could have it first. Do you want it, right? You have 15 minutes, yes or no. That's a different kind of shopping experience than what we get on e-commerce today, but it's certainly something that we can power through the data and insights and the technology that we're going to invest in. Thanks. Um, just a question I have is you mentioned at the very end a little bit about uh, recruiting sellers yeah. and really building that. Can you talk a little bit more about what the strategy is there in terms of recruiting and then also retaining? Folks? Absolutely. Yeah. So we know that we can grow the platform if everybody in this room posts one, five, ten items. That's fabulous. But to really get to those inventory numbers that we need to keep people sticky, um, I'm also going out to brick and mortar stores who need an e-com muscle. Um, their listings on their Shopify sites don't get them to the top of Google in merchant listings. Our stuff already is. I'm selling things now more consistently based on somebody finding it in Google than someone I know buying on the site, which is fabulous, even though we're super early. Um, so I want to be an e-com solution for the Instagram curated sellers 
who are selling on that platform, um, for stores who are in, uh, already kind of there and curating great collections and, and need to turn over inventory much faster. Um, partnering with fan groups, so like obviously I'm in Portland, the Portland Timbers and the Rose City Riveters. We we're gonna we're trying to make a partnership with them, so we're the official resale fan shop of their fan group. Um, and then that allows then for everybody to kind of throw in the things that they have, but allows us to really build up that inventory quickly and over time. And right now we've got, we've launched an MVV, Most Valuable Vendor Program, that includes discounted commissions when people sign up between now and, and the end of April. And then we have incentive tiers in that program. If you have a certain number of listings and a certain number of value in your closet, we'll extend those commissions. We'll bring you out to trade shows with us so you can set up. If you haven't seen the fan wagon booth, right, we've got the the a whole like closet rack with some pretty cool stuff on it. And we can actually bring our vendors and actually do pop up in mark, like in real time. I think, oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, you just hit upon basically partnering with properties. Yeah. Um, how do you structure those partnerships? Because I, I mean, that was gonna be my question for you asked it as well, which is how do you get more sellers to come to you? Absolutely. Yeah, so I think that you know, 2025 is already synonymous with climate, thanks to the Paris Accords. Um, 2025 seems like the right year to open up marketing partnerships as a white or as a new category of official resale fan shop. So we're talking to leagues and teams now about what their fashion strategy is, what their shopping strategy is, and saying, you know, when you're ready, when we're ready next year, it's going to take us a little while to get there. Um, but when we're ready, let's partner together. No, we're not going to replace or cannibalize the first run sale because there's always new players, new kits, et cetera. But we also want to make more like a collective effort to get the data, the transactions, and build a fan community around what's already in people's closets. So it makes sense for teams and leagues that have green solutions around textiles means they're relying on Nike and Adidas to make things out of water bottles and ocean plastics, when this is a truly green solution that they can empower for their fans. And what's the value proposition to those properties in working with them? I mean, what, what are they gonna, are they gonna use that to help their brand? Are they gonna make money off of this? Like, how would you structure yeah, that? Yeah, so we can structure it with commissions. We could do, if it, we could do donations earmarked to charity and green initiatives, um, so they could make some money off of that. They could also uh, get that data and that insights, right? So we think that there's a lot of power in that at scale to say, like, here's what your fans are actually like asking for. Here's how fast something moves when you give it. Is it red or is it blue is actually a pretty compelling question if we can answer it. But right now, the Instagram sellers, the eBay sellers, like that data is not available at scale. So we think we can unlock some pretty cool stuff. One last question from me. Yeah. It's just on the sustainability front, can you talk a little bit about how you're thinking about um, not only the green element for like gear itself, but yeah. shipping and the kind of the other impacts that, um, the business might have on sustainability broadly? Yeah, um, you know, we're trying to do everything um, sustainable and align with, aligning with B Corps standards from the beginning. So for example, like I own a handful of the things that are on the site today. I invested in compostable mailers. So everything that goes out from, from our office is already in a compostable mailer. We use limited packaging and that kind of thing. So those kinds of standards, we can teach our sellers. We'll do trainings and webinars and things for people in that program to say, like, here's how to build your business when you're doing this, but here's how to do it in a way that we think the planet uh, needs. Um, there's certainly a lot of things that, like, as a tiny company, we're not doing yet. And as we grow, we're committed to having um, someone who's focused on that sustainability side because otherwise it's just uh, greenwashing and that's not my style. So I got a minute left. You got anything else? Yeah. Just give some, uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about why you decided to split the fees well, sure. between the sellers and the buyers. I love this question, right? It's the Taylor Swift and Ticketmaster effect. Everybody's going to grumble that, that you're paying $20, $40 more to Ticketmaster in order to get the Taylor Swift ticket. But at the end of the day, you either go, you either have the ticket or you don't. So maybe not like this isn't maybe, you know, a $12 item, it's in play condition, but your two-year-old can definitely run it ragged. Yeah, you might pay $12, so 7% on that, not a big deal. But if you want the Kevin Durant rare jersey that's at our booth, you'll pay 7% because you either have it or you don't, right? And so that allows me to make the commissions we need to run the business 
without putting it all on the seller. And to be competitive in the marketplaces, we need to be competitive at about a 10% commission. And so that's the reason for, for splitting that. Yeah, good question. All right, I think that's my time. Thanks so much. <laughs>